What happens for the New Orleans Saints once Drew Brees' retirement becomes financially official? Wide receiver route trees and breaking down which change about another 2021 regular season opponent all on today's episode of Locked On Saints. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Huda Nation and Huda family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Whether you're listening on your favorite podcast provider or watching on YouTube, thank you very much for being here. Remember that we're here with you every single Monday through Friday, five days a week covering your New Orleans Saints. On yesterday's episode, we broke down post-June 1 transactions. So today, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of Drew Brees' retirement. How much cap space does it truly save the Saints once it becomes financially official? Then, with our midweek fundamental segment that we do every Wednesday, this week we're going to break down wide receiver route trees by the numbers. And finally, we'll take a look ahead to week three of the 2021 NFL season and talk about what's changed about the New England Patriots since the 2020 season. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, co-managing editor over at CanalStreetChronicles.com, and your Tuesday co-host over at the Locked On NFL podcast. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked On Saints, your team every day. All right, family, as always here with you, breaking down the New Orleans Saints. But if you want something to uh, listen to that's going to break down the entire NFL as a whole, make sure you check out the Peacock and Williamson NFL show wherever you get your podcast. So just as a quick reminder, in yesterday's episode, we broke down post-June 1 transactions and how the accounting and financials work around that sort of uh, that date for the NFL. So now we're going to look more specifically at a very likely transaction that we're going to be seeing either today or at some point in the near future now that we're beyond June 1st. Drew Brees already announced his retirement, but the official designation of his retirement was that of a post-June 1 transaction, meaning that the accounting just works a little bit differently. As a quick refresher on that, Usually, if you cut somebody before June 1st and they have prorated bonuses or a signing bonus that's spread out over a couple of years, all of what's left instead of it spreading out or remaining spread out over the next few years ends up accelerating to when you cut them. So it could end up adding some money that you're spending on a player that you moved on from. Same thing as it goes to trades, but slightly different because of the way that base salaries and things like that work with trades. But When it comes to post June 1 or June 2nd and beyond, you just pay what was due that year and then everything else accelerates to next year if there are multiple years remaining after this. So for the Saints with Drew Brees, the $1.075 million base salary is all that they were on the hook for at this point because he took the $23 million pay cut earlier on in the offseason. So now that the retirement should be processing here soon through the NFL's transaction wire, It means that that $1.05 million goes back to the New Orleans Saints, and they no longer have to pay that as a part of his base salary. However, the difference here is that it doesn't really net them $1.075 million on top of the $648,000 that they have available to their name, according to the NFL Players Association. Instead, what happens is that because the top 51 players are the only ones that count against the NFL salary cap right now on each team. And by top 51, I mean the 51 most expensive player contracts are the only ones that count against the team salary cap at this point in the offseason. Drew Brees is going to move out of that top 51. And one of four players that's getting paid about $780,000 is going to move into the top 51. So as soon as you remove Drew Brees' contract, another contract enters that top slate and therefore ends up counting against the salary cap. So you'll save $1.075 million once Drew Brees retires, but you're going to end up having a new charge of about $780,000 once one of those players moves in there. So the easiest way to think about this is that it's essentially really only a savings of about $295,000. That's really the only thing that happens here. So that puts the Saints in range of about $642,000 that they have available to their name. Not a ton to really do anything with considering they need nearly $3 million just to sign their rookie class. 
And of course, more than that, if they want to add to the team's roster. So the bottom line here is that the Saints simply don't get a lot of salary cap relief once this move becomes financially official. So if they want to create salary cap space to add a veteran, to add somebody at the wide receiver two position, the interior defensive line or the cornerback two position, which seem to be the places that they could really end up spending some money by the time that they get to the beginning of the season, they'll still need to work out one of those extensions. So they have until July 15th to work out a long-term extension with Marcus Williams. Otherwise, he has to play 2021 on the franchise tag. As for Ryan Ramchek, it seems that that's somebody that they're intent upon extending from everything that we've heard so far. Just need to see how quickly they can get it done. In the past, they usually don't get these done until training camp, maybe even the beginning of the season in DeMario Davis's case. I've also had some people ask me about the idea of trading veterans like Cam Jordan and Teron Armstead specifically in order to open up some cap space. If you trade Teron Armstead, it makes no difference for your cap space this year. It opens up cap space over the next two seasons, but then loses you cap space for the next two seasons after that. He's got a very weird contract because of all the restructuring. Cam Jordan, who's also been recently restructured, doesn't really save you much money this year either. Again, he saves you around uh, about a million dollars. But once he moves out, another player will move into the top 51. And so it really only saves you a couple hundred thousand dollars more than anything else. However, trading Cam Jordan does open up over $10 million in each of the next few seasons. So if you wanted to get a year ahead of Cam Jordan potentially being somebody that the Saints would look to move on from, which, as I said last week, doesn't feel like something I would see the Saints doing at this time, then that could be an option for them. But it just doesn't seem very likely at the moment that either one of those options would be uh, viable for New Orleans. But we'll see, right? Never say never when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. Coming up next, we're going to jump into our next segment, Midweek Fundamentals, like we do every Wednesday. We're going to break down wide receiver route trees, talk about numbers, talk about the colloquial terms, everything you need to know about those. And then we'll wrap up the show with a look at the New England Patriots, New Orleans Saints week three opponent to talk about what has changed about them since the 2020 season. We have all that coming up for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And I got to tell you about the new flavor over at Built Bar. If you're a fan of Thin Mints, Girl Scout cookies, all of that, Make sure you check out the new grasshopper cookie flavor that they have going on a limited time right now at BuiltBar.com along with nine other delicious flavors. All of those flavors taste like candy bars but have the benefits of a protein bar, 17, 18 grams of protein, but low in sugar, low in calories, low in net carbs, all of that. So really, really fantastic protein bars, the best protein bars on the market. Let me say it one more time for my guy out on YouTube the deliciousest, deliciouser than they even were before. Now, the deliciousest built bars and protein bars that are available. You can find them over at builtbar.com. And when you go, don't forget to use the promo code LOCKED15, that's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, to get 15% off of your order, whether it's your first or your next 15% off with code LOCKED15 at BuiltBar.com. You can also check out our good friends at RockAuto.com. They're going to give you everything that you need for your vehicle from the comfort of your own home without you having to go to any of those chain stores where they're going to try to upsell you on things. They're going to disappear for 20 minutes to try to find the part that they don't actually have, or you're going to end up paying 30, 50, in some cases, 70% more than what you'll pay over at rockauto.com because they're going to charge you the same price, whether you're a professional or a do-it-yourselfer, and they have just about every car make model year that you can imagine covered with several options of the part accessory or piece that you're looking for. So go and check them out over at rockauto.com for all of your vehicle needs. And don't forget to let them know that Locked On sent you by right and Locked On in the How'd You Hear About Us section just below the shipping information at checkout. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Saints. Thank you once again for being here. However it is that you are enjoying the show, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. So on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, we do our midweek fundamentals. And that is a segment to where we break down some of the fundamental aspects of the game of football. We've talked about defensive packages, offensive personnel packages. We also took a look last week at offensive line gaps and defensive line techniques. Now we're going to go out to the skill position over on the offensive side. We're going to take a look at the wide receiver route tree. Now we're just looking at the basic route tree. Different offensive systems have different route trees. Kyle Shanahan's route tree is absolutely insane. Sean Payton's route tree is not just as simple as a one through nine numbered chart, but the one through nine numbered chart is where we start. And that's where we're going to begin 
with today's midweek fundamentals. So we're going to talk about the different routes that different receivers run, how to designate them, how to classify them, where you want to utilize them, and when, and sort of like what the the number is that's associated with each route. We'll, we'll put it all together. The thing to understand if you're watching over on YouTube, what we're looking at right now is a route tree that's courtesy of Bleacher Reports. You can also Google this route tree as well if you're listening on the podcast. But regardless of how it is that you're taking this in, you're going to be able to understand it if you understand two concepts, inside breaking routes and outside breaking routes. The route tree that we're looking at right now is more so, it is a route tree that's built for a wide receiver that's on the left side of the offense. You can see something small down here that says ball with an arrow toward the right. So that's how you know. So the inside of the offense is toward midfield. The outside of the offense is toward the sideline, regardless of where you're lined up. It mirrors on either side of the field, just like we talked about with the offensive line gaps and the defensive line technique. So the thing to note is that every even number, remember these are all um, these are all numbered one through nine, all of the even numbered routes break inside, all of the odd number routes break outside with the exception of the nine route, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. So let's start with the inside breaking routes first. So we're going to start off with a two route or a slant. It's exactly what you know it to be three steps, five steps, and then turn inside at an angle so that you're heading toward midfield, but you're still heading upfield. The other, the next one we'll take a look at is a curl route, which is going to be basically heading upfield. This really varies. This could be seven steps, this could be 10 steps, this could be 15 or 16 steps, and then cutting in and doing the same thing to where you're coming back inside toward midfield, but instead of traveling upfield, you're coming back towards the cornerback, excuse me, the quarterback, that is a curl route. So let's remember those. Slant is a two route. Curl is number four, right? So basically, both of those are inside breaking routes, but either they take you upfield or back downfield, depending upon which route is called. Slant takes you further upfield, and then curl takes you back toward the quarterback. Let's move forward to number six. Again, we're just focused on the inside breaking routes at the moment. Number six is called a dig route, sometimes also called an in route. So that's basically a straight path for your release, and then you break directly towards midfield in a straight line. You don't carry upfield or carry downfield. You just come directly in. This usually goes about as deep as a curl route, but again, it depends on the offense. It depends on the style. It depends on the play caller. But the big difference between a curl and an in or a dig is that instead of you coming back toward the quarterback like you do with a curl route, you go toward midfield in a straight line. These are all quick hitting routes for the most part. An in route can go pretty deep. There will be a deep in. Remember, not all route trees are created the same. But for the most part, these are pretty quick three-step drop type reads, five-step drop type reads that get the ball out of the quarterback's hand quickly. Now, if you're looking for something that's going to attack downfield, but also toward the middle of the field, something maybe you want to use against cover two, which generally leaves the deep middle of the field open, then that's going to be your post route or an eight route. So that's going to be basically a straight release and then uh, going toward the middle of the field, but upfield just like you do with a slant, but you're doing it with the intention of attacking deep as opposed to the intention of attacking toward the middle of the field. All right, so those are your inside breaking routes, two, four, six, and eight. Slant goes upfield and inside. Uh, curl comes downfield and inside back toward the quarterback. Dig or in goes directly toward the middle of the field. Post goes upfield deeper on the inside. Now let's flip the script here and we'll kind of reverse this and go toward the odd numbered routes, which are going to take us one, three, five, seven, and nine, which remember is kind of its own thing. So we take a look at the flat route, which is going to be the number one route. This is your first outside breaking route, and it's also meant to be a quick hit type of a throw. You basically release three, five steps upfield and then immediately turn and go directly toward the sideline. This is a dangerous throw for a quarterback depending upon its relation to the field and the way that this play is called and when this play is called. You remember that this is the route that Janoris Jenkins got his interception and his pick six to open up the season against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This was the route that was run. It was an out route that was or a flat route that was run on a spray release or a diagonal release. It's tough for a quarterback to be on one hash mark on the left side and then throw this route across the field 
toward the right sideline. That's just a lot of distance for that ball to travel and a lot of opportunity for a cornerback to break on that ball and have an easy, easy time with a pick six. So this is a route that I'm always a little bit kind of concerned about when it comes to older quarterbacks. Younger quarterbacks with better ball trajectory are a little bit more successful here. Now let's take the ball a little bit deeper here. We're going to go to three, which is a comeback, which is the curl route, but mirrored. Instead of coming back toward the middle of the field and downfield toward the quarterback, you're going basically downfield, right? Coming back, but you're going outside toward the sideline. This is a really popular route for Michael Thomas and one that Michael Thomas and uh, and Drew Brees were really, really, really in tune with. And then there's another route here that both Michael Thomas and Drew Brees were very efficient at, and it's the out route, which is basically the in route, but the exact opposite, just like it sounds. No trickery here. You go down the field, 7, 10, 15 steps, and then you turn directly toward the sideline as opposed to toward the middle of the field, which would be an in route. That's your out route. And then you're usually trying to make a catch there on the sideline to immediately get out of bounds those types of situations. Now we'll go a little bit deeper downfield and we'll go with an in-breaking route that that attacks deep downfield, which is the corner route or a seven route. It's a post route, but instead of breaking toward the inside, toward the middle of the field and upfield, in this instance with a corner route, you're breaking toward the outside, still attacking downfield. So basically just take the post route and then flip it to a corner route. One of the reasons why this is called a corner route is because in most situations, depending upon where the receiver is lined up, you're going toward the back corner of the end zone. That's the path that you're taking. It's called a post route because you're trying to kind of go upfield. And then as you take your angle, you're going toward the goal post. So you're moving inside and upfield. Corner route, you're moving outside and upfield. Same thing. And then you have the nine route, which is often called the nine route, called the fade, called the streak, called the deep route. It's your basic, just run a straight line. It's your streak, basically, essentially. And that's the nine route. That's the one that doesn't follow in the same footsteps as the rest of the routes as being inside or outside breaking based on its number or based on its value. It's just a straight line down the field. It's a fly route. It's a nine route. It's it's the most exciting route in football when it works, <laughs> but it's also a really good one for defenses too. So that's our review of the wide receiver route tree. This was a little bit complicated to try to talk through. So hopefully we did you justice. The biggest thing to remember is that you're talking about nine routes and basically it's four routes, but they're mirrored, right? So you've got eight total routes, four that go inside, four that go outside. Even numbers track the inside routes, odd numbers track the outside routes, even inside, odd, outside, kind of, kind of, it's kind of makes sense. And then the nine route goes right up the field. So that is the basic wide receiver route tree. Again, it gets way more complicated than that, depending upon what system it is, what coach it is, all of that. But that's the easiest way to go through the your initial introduction to a wide receiver route tree. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at the Saints' third 2021 opponent, the New England Patriots, what has changed about them since 2020 and since the last time that they met in 2017. It's been a while. We'll break it down as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And while the Saints and Patriots game on week three isn't considered one of the games of the year, you can go and check out some game of the year lines over at betonline.ag. They have a ton of lines out there for what they consider to be some of the most important games with every team having at least one for the Saints. It, they're basically not favored in either of the ones that were selected for them. The Halloween game up against Tampa Bay Buccaneers, as well as the Thursday night game against the, da- no, excuse me, the Monday night game against the Seattle Seahawks. They're underdogs in both of those. So if you feel like you want to get in on that action, you can head over and sign up for a free account at betonline.ag. You can also check out MLB, NBA, UFC, MMA odds as well. They have something for everybody at betonline.ag. And when you put down your first deposit so that you can get in on that action, make sure you use the promo code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to get a 50% welcome bonus on your very first deposit. That's on your first deposit only, 50% welcome bonus to help get you jump started on your bankroll by using the promo code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. Let's Get it, Huda Nation, wrapping up today's episode by taking a look at the week three opponent for the New Orleans Saints, the New England Patriots. Talk about what's new about the New England Patriots. And the fact of the matter is that a lot, a lot is new about the New England Patriots. There are a lot of different things going on over there. So let's go ahead and break it down. The last time that these two teams met was not in 2020, but instead in 2017, 
a week two matchup win for the Patriots. Tom Brady was the quarterback. Uh, Rob Gronkowski was the running back. Basically, the Patriots were the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, basically. And the Patriots won that game. They actually ended up winning 36 to 20. That was what looked like it was going to open up a fourth straight, very struggling season for the New Orleans Saints. But of course, they were able to turn that season around after a slow start. Now, how did their 2020 season end in New England? Not as nicely as the last time that the Saints played against them ended. Uh, They ended up the season seven and nine, third in the AFC East for the first time in a long time, not winning that division. Now, What were some of the biggest losses since the 2020 season? Of course, we could talk about Tom Brady, but of course, he wasn't a Patriot in 2020 either. So instead, I'm going to focus on over the offensive side, Joe Tooney, the offensive lineman that has been outstanding for them. and was really their midseason MVP up to a certain point. He is now with the New York Giants. And over on the defensive side, even though he didn't play last year, he had only opted out. He ended up retiring, and that's Patrick Chung, the safety who has been a big-time leader for that unit for a long time. But of course, they have some youth there in Kyle Duggar out of oh Lenore Rhine University, like a very, very small university, but has been an incredible player all throughout college and had a pretty solid rookie season last year as well. So I think he'll step up in place of Patrick Chung just fine, especially now that they're going to ask him probably to play a little bit less linebacker than he had to play last year with Dante Hightower returning from his opt-out season in 2020. Let's talk about some of the biggest in-house free agents that are returning during this season. That's going to be David Andrews, the center who re-signed on a four-year deal, the anchor of their offensive line and a very solid player. Dietrich Wise, defensive tackle, another anchor over on the defensive side, a four-year deal for him as well. He's been really effective for them, and they invested a lot of money. I believe it was $22, total, $22 million total in the defensive tackle to bring him back for 2021. And then, of course, back over on the offensive side, retaining Cam Newton was a big deal, not only for Cam Newton, but for the New England Patriots. They obviously did so before they drafted Mac Jones, which was a very, very smart decision just to make sure that if Mac Jones was the guy that they went into the draft going after but missed out on him, they wanted to make sure that they had a starting caliber quarterback and they have one in Cam Newton. Despite his struggles, he's still a starting caliber quarterback in the NFL and he knows the system and worked with them last year. And the Patriots also retained James White, their do-it-all running back out of the backfield, who would be a great compliment to start off the season with Cam Newton as well out of the backfield. Let's talk about some of the biggest additions in the draft. Have three quick ones here. Of course, Mac Jones, the quarterback out of Alabama at 15th overall. They're able to stand pat, didn't have to give up anything to get their next quarterback or who who I assume they believe is their next quarterback. Had 4,500 yards, 41 touchdowns, and only four interceptions in 2020 on his way to an Alabama national champion. But he's not the only Alabama national champion that they drafted. In the second round, they also brought in defensive tackle Christian Barmore, who, if you listen to any of the pre-draft coverage here at Locked on Saints, you know I was very, very high on and would have actually loved to the New Orleans Saints early on in the draft. But he ends up going to New England, nine and a half tackles for a loss last season, but eight sacks as an interior defensive lineman which is really, really impressive. And they also added edge rusher Ronnie Perkins out of Oklahoma, 10 and a half tackles for a loss in 2020, along with five and a half sacks. Now, the Patriots' biggest offseason story is easily going to be their quarterback position. They re-signed Cam Newton. They drafted Mac Jones. Is there an expectation that Mac Jones becomes the immediate starter in 2021? I don't believe that there is at this time, but you have to imagine that Bill Belichick, much like Sean Payton, is not going to put a ceiling on a rookie. He goes out there and shows that he's a better option than Cam Newton, then expect to see Mac Jones as early in the 2021 season as they're comfortable. However, at this moment, I think it's still Cam Newton's job as he was the starting quarterback last season. We'll just see how long he can hold on to it as they roll through in 2021. The best player for the New England Patriots during the 2020 season? I'm going to kind of go a little bit of a curveball here. I'm going to go with an offensive lineman in Michael Onwenu, who was outstanding in his rookie season, allowing only 14 pressures, only three of which being sacks on 441 pass blocking snaps, according to pro football focus over a 98% efficiency from the offensive line there, despite the fact that he started games at left guard, right guard, and right tackle. So he played all over the place and he only committed one penalty all season, despite all of those snaps that he played. And one of my favorite parts about it is that the penalty that he committed was in a game where he played 81 offensive snaps. So if that happened late in the game, you kind of understand. So Onwardu for me was their bit was their best player. But what about their biggest weaknesses as a team in 2020? I've got a couple of things here. Quarterback obviously was one of them. 
didn't really have the ability to move the ball very well in 2020, specifically in the passing game, but that should improve simply by virtue of there being another option in 2021. Cam Newton had some nice throws, but it wasn't consistent throughout the season, and they did a lot of work on the ground. So the passing game was kind of stagnant for the team in most scenarios. The other thing that was really interesting that I looked at here was via football outsiders, taking a look at their first half offense. They were 30th in passing off, or rather, uh, first half offense, passing or rushing, in terms of their ability to be able to produce in the first half over on the offensive side. They produced at a clip of 17.1% less than the NFL average during that time. So not very productive during the first half, which led to a lot of slow starts and them having to climb their way back into games in the second half. Now, of course, when you have Bill Belichick as your coach, you can deal with that. But if let's say the Saints offense is clicking during this time with whichever quarterback it is, starting off slow is really going to put the Patriots in a bad situation. Also, their pass rush, not very efficient either. Not a surprise to see them lean heavily in the first three rounds on the defensive line. They were tied for the six fewest sacks in the NFL in 2020 with only 24. And finally, what are going to be some of the biggest questions heading into this game? Well, first of all, the most immediate one is, are the Patriots going to be the team to land Julio Jones? Reportedly, they had had some internal conversations about trading for the wide receiver. Could they be the team that ends up landing him? Because otherwise, they don't have a lot of threats at the wide receiver position outside of maybe Nelson Aguilar, who's had a bit of a, a career resurrection in Las Vegas, but is he going to be able to carry that over in New England? Another question is just simply going to be, who's going to be the quarterback? Will it be Cam Newton all season? Can he fend off the young Mac Jones? I mean, certainly he wants to be there about halfway through the season when they take on the Carolina Panthers. It's going to be a very interesting storyline to follow for Cam Newton and the New England Patriots. So ideally, he's able to stay healthy at least that long and be able to maintain the uh, starting role that long for his own purposes. But it's going to be a very fun situation to watch over in New England when it comes to the quarterback situation. And another interesting storyline here is going to be which of these two coaches is going to be able to show longevity in success without their Hall of Fame quarterback. So far over the last two years, Sean Payton has a comfortable lead at eight and one over the last nine games without his starting quarterback in Drew Brees, uh, you know, five and oh with Teddy Bridgewater in 2019, uh, three and one. Yes. Is that how math works? Yes. Three and one with uh, Taysom Hill in 2020. But for uh, Bill Belichick, he's seven and nine in the 2020 season without Tom Brady five and four over his last nine. All right, y'all. Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of Locked on Saints. Make sure you come back tomorrow for our top three Thursday as we look at some of the top three storylines heading into training camp, not necessarily competitions or anything of that matter, but taking a look at some of the stories, some things. We'll have a little bit of fun with this one that you might want to be looking forward to when it comes to training camp. And I have one very big question about the Saints quarterback challenge And I'll bring that up tomorrow, but we'll talk a bit more about that as well as a couple of other topics going into training camp for the 2021 NFL season. Make sure you go and check out the Locked On Today podcast as they continue to keep you up to date with everything going on across the world of sports in less than 20 minutes. As always, I'm so grateful for everything that you do to help grow the family here with this show, whether you're watching, listening, rating, reviewing, sharing, subscribing, all of it means the world. You can always find me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them trust you, that nation. I'll holla at you.